security and compliance. My name is Robert Brzezinski, and because this is my first time at ISSA InfoSec Summit, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so, I speak Polish. Some people say it's the most difficult language in the world to learn. Uh, it took me a few years, but I managed to learn it. I don't have 25 years experience in information security, but I do have 25 years experience in management. Uh, and I can't resist from citing Sean Harris saying that information security is a management issue that may require a technical solution. So I look at my info, short InfoSec tenure uh, as an advantage sometimes. I bring a fresh perspective, and especially in context of cloud technologies, I couldn't learn this stuff 10 years ago even. Um, I know one thing, that I don't have all the answers, and I need to learn continuously, so trying to keep up with the technology. Uh, a little bit about my certifications. You are probably familiar with the CISA certification from ISACA. Uh, the CHPS stands for Certified in Healthcare Privacy and Security. And this certification is awarded by the AHIMA organization. AHIMA stands for American Health Information Management Association. Uh, a lot of privacy officers in hospitals and healthcare systems um, have this certification. I work with the AHIMA Exam Development Committee for this certification to bring a little more focus on IT, on information security, and uh, help bridge the gap between the health information management professionals, between the privacy professionals, and those working in IT and those working on the IT security teams, or even on audit teams. Uh, and I've been pretty successful with that. Uh, the number of technical questions have actually increased in that um, in the exam for that certification. I have also passed the exam for Certified Information Security Manager with ISACA, so I will be pursuing this certification in the future. And a little bit about my company. Uh, we're small, uh, I should say, we're boutique uh, information security risk management consulting practice. Uh, we work with small and medium-sized organizations, and we help them with privacy, security, and compliance challenges, and you can find more about us on the, on the website here. Uh, how many of you are actually implementing Office 365, or maybe using Office 365 currently? Okay, a, a, a few, okay, a few companies, yeah. My objective for, um, for this presentation today is to help you understand the Office 365 compliance, um, kind of the built-in features, uh, security and compliance features, uh, and to help you understand uh, what those features are and how you can use them to satisfy your business security or compliance needs. Uh, and also, if you are working on a security team, to help you verify um, whether your Office 365 environment has been configured securely. Uh, and if you are on the auditing side of the house, so to speak, uh, how to define a scope for Office 365 environment audit, how to take advantage of uh, available um, reporting and auditing capabilities within the Office 365. Uh, ultimately, at the end, hopefully, um, you will be able to make a kind of an educated decision about whether this solution is uh, fitting your current information security strategy, um, if it fits your uh, business needs within your organization. I should also say that I do not work for Microsoft. I'm not paid for Microsoft. Uh, every um, all, the, all the tools that we use in our consulting practice, uh, we pay for those tools and licenses, just like our customers would do so. Uh, so here's the agenda for this presentation. Um, I'll, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, priorities in information security, and I wanted to talk about how hackers break in, just a, a very few uh, slides. And then I'll talk about Office 365 compliance with federal regulations, and I'll talk about the email protection within the Office 365 environment. And then I'll talk about protection of data and collaboration environment, like SharePoint and OneDrive for Business. And I'll talk about protection of the user credentials. And what are the built-in kind of a compliance features uh, within the Office 365? Hi, folks. I'm Geek here. Unfortunately, I had a video freeze up. So we also lost audio during that portion. And it should start up again about the five-minute, six-second mark. Sorry for the technical glitch.
for balance. This information comes from the Verizon Data Breach Incident Report. And I highlighted healthcare because this is the area that I mostly work with. So, uh, as you see at the, on the bottom row from the left, um, lost devices or stolen assets contribute to about 16% of uh, security incidents, of data breaches, uh, in healthcare organizations. And if you are working within a healthcare industry, you know that Office for Civil Rights maintains something that is called a wall of shame, uh, where all of the data breaches affecting more than 500 individuals are posted. It's a federal website. So, and, and the data from this uh, federal website basically is in line with those findings here. So, the second uh, area where most of the um, uh, resulting in, in most of the uh, security incidents and um, data breaches in healthcare uh, is attributed to miscellaneous errors. Those miscellaneous errors could be emails sent to wrong recipients, faxes sent to wrong telephone numbers, um, incorrect disposal or sanitization of some of the media or um, hard drives and, and basically uh, media that is used to transport some of the data. And what's interesting about this, um, what's interesting about this uh, area is that about 60% of those miscellaneous errors can be attributed to administrators' errors. So how do we prevent that? How Office 365 can actually help you, you know, minimize those incidents? Um, the last but not least area of focus for, for healthcare is privilege misuse. Uh, that's where people have too many privileges, and that's when people misuse those privileges and steal data, basically, to monetize them in, in some sort of a way. You may have a chance to review the 2016 California Data Breach Report that came out, I think, in the beginning of March. Um, this report, the findings of this report, are very much in line with the findings of um, Verizon Data Breach Report. And I talk about this because I want to talk, I want to put this conversation about Office 365 in, co in context of those three major areas <clears throat> that create issues for healthcare. Just a few more, just a few more words about um, what are the prevailing kind of a threat actions for um, organizations that need to uh, protect sensitive data and. This is, again, this information comes from Verizon Data Breach Report. And as you see, uh, credentials, loss of credentials or compromise of credentials is a, a major kind of a threat action that uh, organizations are uh, fighting with, so to speak. And phishing also is an important element that we need to pay attention to. So how those um, data breaches and security incidents happen? They very often happen through email. Email is a kind of a primary method of delivery of malicious content and is um, either malicious content or, or uh, emails with links to malicious websites where users can click on the links, go, and um, if their devices are not updated, uh, vulnerable, can uh, get infected with malware and that may ultimately lead to a data compromise. Um, sometimes lost devices lead directly to kind of a data loss, uh, but lost devices also lead to a data compromise ultimately. And that may result in, um, you know, compromise of uh, credentials that allow the bad guys to access uh, corporate networks. Uh, and lost devices also contain a lot of data that may be sensitive and need to be protected. So I'll talk about Office 365, how Office 365 can help you um, protect emails, protect data in collaboration environment like SharePoint, and how Office 365 can help you protect user credentials. But before that, I'm going to focus a little bit on the compliance of the Office 365 solution. So, if you are, you can use an Office 365 Trust Center kind of a uh, keywords to search for Office 365 Trust Center uh, website. 
that actually lists all of those regulatory frameworks uh, that Office 365 complies with. And it also lists um, uh, some additional information. I wanted to highlight just a few things. Um, Office 365 complies with the HIPAA regulations. What that means is that the subscribers to Office 365 can actually sign a business associate agreement with Microsoft, uh, which is part of the regulatory requirement uh, in HIPAA regulations. In November 2014, um, Office 365 has received uh, authorization to operate from FedRAMP. FedRAMP stands for Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program. What that means is that basically the federal review, if you will, uh, approved the use of Office 365 for uh, federal, state, and local governments. Um, they said it's okay to use this tool um, for uh, various government entities. But Microsoft has also signed CGIS addendum. CGIS stands for Criminal Justice Information Systems. They have signed an addendum with California with New York, Texas, and Illinois, four largest states in the United States. What that means? That means that the law enforcement agencies and the criminal justice systems, or criminal justice agencies, if you will, are okay with using Office 365 to conduct their business. Uh, I think those are pretty significant um, kind of a steps in uh, transparency of how this solution meets various regulatory requirements. I also wanted to add, because a lot of people um, in security, I think, when you are making that step and starting adopting cloud solutions, uh, for a lot of people, um, there is always an issue about, okay, how are we going to trust into uh, this, those tools, those, cl those cloud-based tools, without having a total control of those tools? And that is definitely an issue, but that's why you need to select a trustworthy partner that uh, meets some of those regulatory requirements and um, has been verified by um, maybe a government organization or uh, organizations like uh, Cloud Security Alliance. For me, if Office 365 is okay to be used by federal, state, and local governments, if it meets the requirements of um, law enforcement agencies, it's okay for my small or medium-sized business. I also wanted to add that based on some Microsoft presentations, uh, Microsoft says that they have spent over $50 billion in their security investments. Um, I'll tell you one thing. Last year, Microsoft acquired 15 companies. That's more than Google or Facebook. Google and Facebook are very aggressive about acquiring new companies. They have acquired Adalom, they have acquired Secure Islands, they have acquired um, Revolution Analytics. All those companies, so well, some of those companies deal with big data analytics, some of them deal with uh, protection of um, users in a cloud environment, and some of those companies deal with identity protection in a um, cloud environment. <coughs> So for me, those are pretty strong um, endorsements, if you will. So let's talk about email protection and um, how Office 365 protects uh, users' emails. If you have an on-premises exchange environment, a lot of those features that are available in Office 365 are very familiar to exchange administrators because those features are very, uh, very similar. The Exchange uh, Online Protection provides phishing and malware protection for emails. Um, the things that I really wanted to highlight is um, anti-spoofing technologies available in Office 365, actually protecting your users' uh, emails um, from phishing attacks. I also wanted to emphasize uh, an add-on set of features available in Office 365 that is called Advanced Threat Protection. This is actually some pretty neat set of tools. Um, when an attachment is detected in an email, the advanced threat protection actually explodes these attachments in the um, kind of a sandbox environment before delivery. If any anomalous content is detected in this attachment, the, the recipient of an email will not receive that attachment. Um, 
The advanced threat protection also, in real time, does a behavioral analysis of the links that are included in an email. If those links are leading to a malicious website, the users, when they click on the link, they will actually receive a warning that they are about to visit a malicious website. What is even more interesting is the fact that administrators have a pretty good view into who is targeted with those malicious uh, emails or emails with the malicious content. They can also see who is clicking on those links uh, to malicious websites. So they really receive a feedback like they would receive from any kind of a phishing tool used to test employees, for example. So I find this pretty, uh, pretty helpful. Office 365 also provides a um, set of protection features or safeguards um, that are focused on outbound email. And some of those, set, those features are around the data loss protection, uh, prevention features. So uh, some of those are kind of out of the box ready um, data loss prevention rules that are available within Office 365. You just have to enable them to be, to be active and uh, uh, protecting the users. And some of those rules have to be configured through a set of so-called mail flow rules. Uh, and those mail flow rules actually allow you to also configure uh, data loss prevention rules for uh, maybe that are very specific to your organization. Uh, the mail flow rules also allow you to configure Office 365 automatic encryption uh, and decryption of emails. Uh, and they also allow you to implement what I call an email supervisory workflow. Uh, an email supervisory workflow is um, a feature that you could use, for example, for uh, employees that are suspected of, of misbehavior, or you can use it for junior employees. Let's say you have a junior employee who is just starting work in your company and is assigned a, a very important client account. Uh, and for a month, let's say you would like to, um, you would like the supervisor of this junior employee have the ability to actually review the emails of this junior employee before the, those emails go out to uh, this very important client. So uh, that's why you create that kind of an email workflow that allows the supervisor to review the email, uh, reject it, or approve it and send it forward. So those are some of the some of the good features that actually help you prevent some of those miscellaneous errors from happening. And I also wanted to mention that um, Office 365 provides you a uh, certain ability to control mobile devices at, uh, and access to um, email and Outlook on mobile devices. So for organizations that don't have a separate uh, mobile device management solution, this is uh, putting in place at least basic safeguards because the mobile device management um, within the Office 365 allows you to push policies that will uh, enforce uh, device encryption, uh, password blank for complexity, uh, screen lock, uh, those type of things. And you also have the ability to actually um, selectively uh, wipe the device. So you can wipe the exchange content, contacts, emails, or any documents that were uh, kind of stored through the um, Outlook email, if you will. So some of those, like I said, uh, those are pretty neat features that allow you to uh, especially for smaller organizations that may not have the resources for, you know, a more advanced mobile device management solutions. Um, this is at least putting a basic safeguards into um, mobile devices. As, you know, also in a scenario when you are maybe allowing employees to bring, the, uh, bring their own devices and retrieve the email on their own personal devices. You have a basic features that allow you to put some safeguards around that. <coughs> Uh, these are just uh, basic screenshots, kind of examples of how the um, data loss prevention rule work. And for example, this set of data loss prevention rules here uh, detects uh, IP addresses. And the users are basically um, presented with a policy tip, tip uh, that tells them that they cannot send this email. Uh, you may also incorporate um, mail flow rules that will allow the users to uh, override the policy and send the email. Uh, the administrators will be able to see through some of the reporting capabilities 
um, how the data loss prevention rules actually work and who is overriding or, or what type of messages are being overridden. So you can actually tweak how your data loss prevention rules uh, work within your environment for your organization. Uh, and the second screenshot, uh, screenshot on the right, this is uh, a recipient experience of Office 365 encryption, encrypted email or encrypted messaging. I love this solution because you can send encrypted email to anyone outside of your organization. And the recipient of an encrypted email can retrieve it on a mobile device or on their computer. And what they can do also is they don't have to have Office 365 subscription. They don't have to have Microsoft account to retrieve this, this encrypted message. They can use a one-time one passcode to retrieve that message. Uh, even uh, more importantly, they can respond in an encrypted, in, a, in an encrypted secure way to, uh, to the sender uh, through the same encryption uh, portal. And um, they can even attach, uh, attach uh, attachments to those uh, messages. So it's, uh, it's a pretty useful feature. This is just a slide that shows some of the compliance features built into Office 365. Again, some of those compliance features will help you prevent some of those uh, privilege misuses. Okay? So I talked about the data loss prevention rules. And from a legal perspective, Office 365 offers the e-discovery and lit litigation hold capabilities. So uh, you can actually assign the roles within Office 365 to your HR people or to your legal team to be the e-discovery manager and collect information in situations when you have a, some sort of an investigation going on. Uh, you also have the ability to, you know, configure retention policies, archiving, and you have a set of auditing reports. Uh, I really like auditing reports and, and capabilities within Office 365, not only for um, kind of the auditing purposes or compliance purposes, but also for security purposes. Uh, and you have reports that will tell you uh, whether the admins are accessing any um, non-owner mailboxes, what are the admins' activities within your Office 365 environment, within the exchange in this particular situation. So let's talk about protection of the data in, um, in the SharePoint environment, um, in the collaboration environment. Again, this is um, the security in the SharePoint environment is to help you prevent those miscellaneous errors from happening. Those miscellaneous errors will also include the fact that sometimes people post sensitive data on um, public sites that should not be access accessible um, to the public. It happens. SharePoint can prevent that. Office 365 is a public cloud solution. And I know a lot of people have issues about that. But that's where you know the whole concept of public cloud starts and that's where we start talking about the security architecture, uh, separating tenants. In SharePoint, uh, when you create different sites for different purposes, those are like data containers that basically allow you to maintain that logical separation of data. So there is no way the data can spill from one site to another. Uh, this logical separation also helps you um, manage permissions for those sites because they are separate. So it's probably more less less probable that you will make a mistake and assign privileges to individuals who shouldn't be accessing certain sites. Um, as I mentioned, the, the uh, ability to manage permission is very granular within uh, Office 365, within SharePoint environment. You can allow people to see the entire sites, or you can allow them to see only specific documents or site <coughs> folders. So we have really a lot of power in uh, who do you grant access to certain documents. You can also limit ability of the users to share data with external uh, email addresses outside, outside of your organization, another good kind of a safeguard. You also have data loss prevention rules in SharePoint. Uh, those have to be uh, configured separately from uh, DLP rules in Exchange environment. And you have a pretty good alerting uh, features in SharePoint. Um, alerting features help me understand if um, someone had made changes that they were not supposed to do, for example. Uh, in a collaboration environment, if I'm collaborate, collaborating with someone, 
the other thing, other thing when it is enabled, will allow, will basically, the SharePoint will send, send me a message when my collaborator from, let's say, New York, uploads a document that I need to review. <coughs> Um, I will receive the automatic message so I can kind of add my two cents to that document or project that we are working on. Uh, from the administrator's perspective, like I said, a very good feature to have an understanding who has uh, viewed certain documents, who has uh, edited certain documents. One thing I wanted to also highlight is that all of the content, all of the files that are uploaded to SharePoint environment or, or uh, OneDrive for Business, or scan for malware. So on the other hand, when you are downloading something from a SharePoint environment or OneDrive for Business, there is a fair amount of assurance that th those files do not contain uh, malicious content. Um, one other thing, you know, in uh, from the beginning of the year, we had a lot of um, kind of a, um, a media articles about ransomware infections in you know hospitals in California, in Kentucky, in Germany. Uh, it, it just became a, a, a very um, kind of a, a thing that, that creates a lot of anxiety and, and excitement about um, SharePoint and OneDrive for Business actually allow you to recover documents from computers that were possibly infected with ransomware. Uh, sometimes people, what people do is you create, you automatically synchronize documents from OneDrive for Business with your uh, um, with the cloud, right? And you can also create automatic syncing for some SharePoint sites or folders. So let's say your device is, in, is um, infected with ransomware and all your documents are encrypted. Those um, folders uh, on your computer that point out to OneDrive for Business or shared, uh, SharePoint site uh, libraries or folders or, or sites, those documents in those folders will be encrypted as well and will be automatically pushed to the cloud in an encrypted format, right? Bad thing. For all of the consumer-grade products like Google, uh, like OneDrive, the regular OneDrive Microsoft, or Google Docs, or things like that, you are losing those documents because they're being encrypted and they're being pushed to the cloud and you cannot recover them. In SharePoint or OneDrive for Business, you actually have something that's called version history. So because those encrypted files will have a different hash signatures, they will have a different version recorded by uh, SharePoint or OneDrive for Business. So you can go, log into your environment and actually find the older version and recover your documents. So it's a kind of a feature that helps you recover a little better. I also wanted to highlight the um, information rights management oftentimes referred to as rights management services within a SharePoint environment and within a desktop environment as well. Um, rights management services, think of it as a, as a file encryption feature with, um, with classification policy applied at the same time. So the rights management services allow you to protect documents in a form of file encryption it allows you to uh, limit access and editing capabilities to sp for specific uh, people that are allowed to uh, see those documents, that, are the, that those documents are shared with. It allows you to manage content expiry and um, allow, allows you to track who has viewed the documents. Uh, so those are some additional kind of a safeguards that you can put in place. Uh, this is an example of rights management services and how they work in, in kind of a real time or real life scenario. Uh, on the left, you see basically, uh, you know, if you want to share a document in a in a protected way, in a secure way, you create an email, you attach the document, and you click a, an um, an icon that says uh, "Share Protected." Uh, that automatically opens the um, ad protection uh, window, and you can um, decide. Uh, what level of editing capabilities are you willing to give the recipient of this document? Whether you want to, whether you want the content to expire at a certain date, uh, and if you want to keep track of, um, you know, who has viewed this document. Is that it dependent on the individual, like email, or is that a setting you can do, like kind of like a global ID? So basically, um, I think this shows even a little better. Um, you see the policy set up here. So those are, you can set, in Office 365, you can actually set up company-wide policies for, for document protection. 
that's a very good question. Thank you. Which makes it easier in you know um, managing how people can share documents. Yeah. So this is just an example of how rights management services can be used for protection of the documents in place on a laptop. Let's say I have an unencrypted laptop because I never have access or never store uh, sensitive data on this laptop. But here is a situation. I need to review this document that contains sensitive data. Okay? If I have um, rights management services enabled in my environment and I have the rights management services app installed on my computer, I can actually protect this document through this um, file encryption feature uh, on my document. And I can set uh, you know, either a customized uh, protection levels or I can select the company-wide protection levels to do that. Uh, the good thing about rights management services is also that you can, um, the users on mobile devices can uh, download the app and retrieve the documents protected with uh, rights management services as well. And they and they they don't have to be Office 365 subscribers or anything like that. So, okay. Um, SharePoint compliance. These are just a couple um, kind of items, characteristics about SharePoint compliance. Again, you have the data loss prevention rules that you can configure and protect um, your organization from you know accidental data leakage. Uh, you have the e-discovery capabilities, and you can uh, configure your retention policies and archiving policies. And you have a set of auditing reports that allow you to see what's going on in your environment. Um, there is a set of um, Office 365 audit log reports, and I'll talk about this in just a minute. It gives you a very uh, in-depth view of what's going on in your environment. Um, and again, you have the information rights management uh, rights management services that allow you to you know, avoid uh, or minimize the chances for those miscellaneous errors and allow you to uh, manage or mitigate the privilege misuse as well. So let's talk about protecting user, users' credentials. Um, as you remember, you know, loss of uh, devices, loss of data, privilege misuse, uh, um, uh, protection of user credentials are the kind of the items that I wanted to focus on in context of this conversation around Office 365 uh, security and compliance. So uh, Office 365 has the um, administrative panel, so, so to speak, where you manage uh, you know, licenses and users and so on. The most important feature in managing um, Office 365 users is the Active Directory. Uh, and you have uh, Active Directory in Azure. If you have um, on-premises environment and you have on-premises Active Directory, you can actually synchronize your on-premises uh, Active Directory with Azure Active Directory. So you do not have to maintain two separate environments. You maintain just one Active Directory and um, those Active Directories can be synchronized. Um, we work with a lot of organizations that are that may have 10 or 15 users in the office and 100 to 150 users in a field. And those users, uh, those employees, those, those field employees, they come to the office maybe once a month or maybe once every two months. Uh, without the active, uh, without the Azure Active Directory, some of the organizations are really not managing those users. They're really not the smaller ones. We work with, with a lot of smaller and medium-sized organizations. And it's a challenge for them to, to manage the users and to see whether they are logging into the environment whether they are using the services, what they're doing. So Azure Active Directory is kind of an uh, answer to um, managing those mobile users. And it allows you for a lot of uh, kind of a configuration settings that will, you know, customizing configuration settings that will uh, be important for your organization. You can set up, you know, safe IP ranges. Uh, you can uh, set different authentication and notification uh, parameters. So, so there is a lot of uh, a lot of flexibility there. I also wanted to say that um, Office 365 allows you to implement multi-factor authentication. So, and and multi-factor authentication in itself is very um, very flexible in how you can implement it because uh, you can, for example, in, in configure it in a way that. If you have uh, an employee logging in from your corporate office environment, the two-factor or multi-factor authentication will be suspended. 
But if the same user is logging into your Office 365 environment from outside of your corporate office, the two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication will be triggered, and they will have to provide it, you know, authenticate with the second factor as well. So it's an additional feature. Uh, recently, uh, Microsoft actually rolled out a number of um, um, kind of additional features that help you uh, manage better, I think, um, Azure Active Directory. And I'll talk about this in just a second. But um, Azure Active Directory Identity Protection Services allow you to basically, uh, in a very concise uh, way, understand whether which of your users are potentially at risk or um, which of your um, signings, so to speak, uh, are anomalous and uh, need to be investigated further. Uh, there is also a feature that Microsoft rolled out um, that is called Azure Active Directory, Active Directory um, uh, Privileged User Management, uh, which uh, basically allows you to manage the administrators of your Office 365. And you can manage those administrative rights through assign, basically uh, removing the permanent administrative rights to your Office 365 environment and only assign them on a temporary basis uh, with the two-factor authentication. So that's, a, that's an additional, I think, very strong feature because obviously administrators, I mean, they can do all the things in your entire cloud environment. So that's, I think, a, uh, a security feature or safeguard that, that should be um, kind of a paid attention to. Um, I talked a little bit about, um, you know, auditing and reporting uh, features that I like within the Office 365. Even the basic Azure Active Directory uh, that comes with your Office 365 subscription will give you some of the um, um, kind of the alerts and reports about anomalous sign, uh, uh, some anomalous activities within your Office 365 environment. Uh, users signing from two different geographical uh, locations. Uh, could potentially indicate a, a compromise of user credentials or maybe that the users are sharing passwords. Uh, in both situations, you want to take some follow-up actions. Uh, users signing in from suspicious IP addresses and things like that. So there's some uh, a set of pretty good uh, reports. So I talked a little bit about the Azure Active Directory reports. And if you have an Azure Active Directory premium subscri subscription, you will have even a, you know more in-depth access to um, reporting capabilities that will tell you whether the users are potentially signing in from uh, devices that are maybe infected. Um, a lot of a lot of insight. There is also a set of uh, reports, kind of auditing reports in exchange um, uh, for the exchange environment. Uh, and I think some of those reports, you know, they point out what the administrators are doing in your environment. Uh, I look at those reports oftentimes not just to um, control the admins, but also to protect the admins. Because uh, people sometimes question, what do the admins do? What do they have access to? Uh, and I think Office and those reporting capabilities provide significant amount of transparency and ability to answer some of those questions. Uh, some of my uh, clients, you know, they often often ask, you know, will the admins have access to my email? Uh, this is a common question about the, from the end users, as not, especially in smaller organizations when they use external vendors to uh, manage their, um, you know, IT infrastructure. <clears throat> SharePoint. Uh, SharePoint reports can also be pulled out through the graphic user interface, but I also wanted to highlight that if you have Office 365 or thinking about it, there is a need for learning a little bit of PowerShell. Uh, there are some features within the Office 365 that can only be configured with the PowerShell scripts. Uh, and there's also some reporting capabilities that are especially useful in uh, SharePoint uh, where PowerShell will pull the reports a lot faster, and um, they're just better. So uh, it makes sense to learn a little bit of the PowerShell scripts to, to, take, to make use of those. Uh, I talked a little bit about the Office uh, 365 audit log reports. Uh, those are very in-depth reports. In case of any type of an indicator of a compromise or any type of a need for investigation, those, those audit log reports will provide you with the insight on um, 
Exchange environment, on your Office 365 administrator's environment, SharePoint, uh, Skype for Business, anything. So a very good set of reports. Um, you know, um, I talked about security in Office 365, and I talked about securing the email, um, securing the end users in a sense. So Office 365 has a pretty strong anti-phishing and anti-spoofing capabilities that allow you to kind of minimize the potential for phishing attacks uh, or the effects of those um, phishing attacks. It has a significant features that allow you to protect the data, and I talked about the data loss prevention rules uh, in SharePoint and in your Exchange environment. So basically, if somebody is trying to send social, you know, an email containing a document or containing a content that has a social security number, so I'm just trying to be extreme at this point, uh, the data loss prevention rules will help you uh, contain the potential uh, data leak. Okay, and uh, I talked about the rights management services and the encryption capabilities. Uh, a lot of built-in, out-of-the-box tools available in this office. Office 365 environment. And I talked about uh, access management and protecting of the uh, protection of the user credentials. Azure Active Directory, strong reporting capabilities, a very good configuration features, and uh, multi-factor authentication. Easy to manage and easy to deploy. Um, I talked, maybe I didn't talk a little bit about Office uh, operational reports, but there is a number of very good reporting and uh, uh, alerting features in Office 365. And I think if you need to investigate an issue or if you need to uh, maintain documentation for your compliance purposes, Office 365 makes it a lot easier. We've done a number of engagements with organizations maintaining um, Exchange environment, Active Directory, on-premises, it's very hard to get any type of good reporting or compliance reporting from those environments. And I'm talking about the smaller and medium-sized organizations. Maybe the large organizations have all those pieces in place. But from my experience, it's very hard to get a good compliance reporting and things like that. So uh, just to kind of almost end this, I, uh, you know, we work with a lot of smaller and medium-sized organizations. And... Um, I've never seen a small or medium-sized organization spending a lot of money on thinking about or, or developing information uh, technology strategy or governance or, or thinking about information security strategy. Um, so I think that Office 365, because it has all of those security and compliance features kind of built in, you don't have to buy additional things. You just have to enable some of the things or configure some of the things in the Office 365. I think Office 365 is a kind of a shortcut for a lot of those smaller and medium-sized companies or those maybe working in, uh, I call it a very distributed environment, when you have a lot of satellite offices, when you have a lot of people in the field. Uh, I think uh, this solution allows those organizations to implement a pretty solid uh, um, information security strategy and build the rest of the strategy around around this particular solution. So, uh, you know, I talked a lot about Office 365 email and uh, document protection and uh, SharePoint environment, uh, but email and credential protection is not everything in security, right? So, here is something that I use for our company, and on the right you see this is basically an example of Azure. Uh, security services and auditing services. So on the right, I see basically uh, status of my devices. I have a little bit of a vulnerability perspective on my environment, whether those devices are updated, whether the operating system is updated, whether they are running antivirus software, okay? Now, on the left, I see a little more interesting information. Computers with clean event logs, policies changes, policies change, uh, user accounts change, uh, this, the the uh, IP addresses that are suspicious maybe, locked out accounts, failed logins, what are those? Those are all potential indicators of compromise, right? I'd like to know about those things because those things will actually help me focus on what I need to do, what I need to look at, what I need to investigate more. And then I can use the, audit, the Office 365 uh, audit logs. So, to me, this is a pretty uh, pretty good environment to look at, pretty good platform to look at and see if uh, 
you know, um, there are any anomalous activities detected in my environment. Uh, it helps me kind of a focus on what I need to look at, look next. Okay, so um, with that, I just uh, wanted to say thank you, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Okay, thank you.